The next speaker is Dinesh D'Souza, who is the leading young, young, he's still young, conservative writer in America, and uh, is a fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford and uh, uh, one of America's most influential conservative thinkers, that's clear. And, uh, his most, and he just writes a stream of books. He's got another one out shortly. And uh, his last one was The Incendiary Enemy at Home, Dinesh D'Souza. Thank you very much. I'm uh, delighted to be back at Freedom Fest. I uh, want to uh, violate the spirit of the debate a little bit by praising uh, Ron Paul. I want to say how uh, um, impressed we are as conservatives that he is saying things that not only libertarians but also conservatives believe. I also want to say that Larry Abraham and I are here not as defenders or shills but in some ways as critics of the Bush administration. This may seem a little surprising. I think where we disagree with our opponents is that they criticize Bush for getting involved and we criticize him for not winning the war. So our disagreement is, in a, way, in a sense, tactical. Uh, I also want to say a word of criticism, if I may, of libertarianism. And what I mean by this is that libertarianism, to be consistent, should be a defense of the principle of liberty. Now, it is liberty and not any other principle that should be at the forefront. Non-intervention is a useful thing, but it is subordinate to the primary principle of liberty. So the dilemma of the libertarian is, if you can intervene abroad to secure liberty, should you do it, or should you abstain in the name of a non-interventionism that would undermine the promotion of liberty abroad? Now, it could be argued that we should not inter intervene Ron Paul focused his argument on non-intervention because it seems for a libertarian to be somehow uh, paradoxical, to say the least, to use force to promote freedom. There seems something inherently contradictory in employing coercion to try to secure liberty. But let us remember, looking around the world, that while it's very easy to say things like you can't impose freedom at the point of a bayonet, when you look at the actual world, we see that you can, and we did. The United States imposed freedom at the point of a bayonet on Japan and on Germany after World War II, and the results have been very positive for freedom. Imagine if we hadn't done it. Usually when freedom comes to a country, this may be a regrettable truth about politics or human nature, it alas comes by force. How did we get freedom in this country? We had a revolution. Revolutions are rarely peaceful and never legal. How, how did African Americans get freedom? It took a civil war to secure for the slaves a freedom that they were in no position to secure for themselves. So freedom sometimes does come by force. I find it interesting that we had a defense of non-intervention that didn't really focus on the subject of our debate, which is Iraq. I want to say a few words about that. I was on a college campus the other day and someone said to me, Mr. D'Souza, in retrospect, would you admit that the Iraq invasion by Bush was a mistake? And I said to him, I said, in retrospect, I would admit it. In retrospect, I wish the United States had focused a little more attention on Iran. Iran has been the first major state to fall into the hands of the Islamic radicals. The Iranians were apparently pursuing the weapons of mass destruction with the same zeal and clearly more success than Saddam. So with the benefit of hindsight, we maybe should have focused our attention there. But I said, let's not be too cocky about it because the truth is no statesman ever got to make a decision in retrospect. The statesman, like the entrepreneur, is in the moving current of events and you have to make decisions with the information available at the time. Now, one can say today, with the benefit of some hindsight, why are we in Iraq? What are we trying to achieve there? Let me answer that question in this very simple way. Try to imagine yourself as a young Muslim who lives in the Middle East. If you, if you look around that part of the world, you see a very interesting sight. You see two types of regimes, two types of government. On the one hand, you see Islamic tyranny. And what's an example of Islamic tyranny? Iran, the rule of the mullahs. On the other hand, you see what can be called secular tyranny. What's an example of secular tyranny? Everybody else, 
Assad in Syria, Abdullah in Jordan, the royal family in Saudi Arabia, Mubarak in Egypt, the Gulf kingdoms, the list goes on. So the truth of it is, from the ordinary Muslim's point of view, there is, in a sense, no freedom in the Middle East. Should I go for Islamic tyranny or should I go for secular tyranny? It's not all that surprising that some Muslims, being Muslim, choose to go for Islamic tyranny. So the United States is attempting in Iraq to put a third option on the table. Call it Muslim democracy. Now, I want to pull back here because there are lots of silly people who have been prancing around saying, the United States is the world's policeman. The United States is going to promote democracy everywhere. Nonsense. The United States is not the world's policeman. It is not our job to promote. Uh, it is not our job to be deposing and defenestrating and cast and tyrants all over the world. No. In Iraq, we are not trying to impose democracy everywhere. But we are just trying to impose it somewhere to give the Muslims an alternative to the forms of tyranny that dominate their world. Now, it is very important that we succeed in Iraq because if we don't, the core libertarian value of freedom will be undermined worldwide. Think about it. What is the most unfree part of the world today? It's the Middle East. Iraq represents an effort, and Bush may be doing a terrible job of it, and he may be failing, but at least he's trying. He is trying to implant the seed of democracy in a part of the world that's never known it. The Islamic radicals already control one major country, Iran. They have been trying for more than a generation now to export the Khomeini revolution to other major Muslim countries. They have not succeeded. Iran was an unexportable revolution in part because of the peculiarity of that country. Iran is Persian and not Arab. It is Shia and not Sunni. The Islamic radicals are desperate to get their hands on another major state, and they have very clearly said it should be Iraq. They have already announced in their videos and in their pamphlets that if they get Iraq, they will then target Egypt and Saudi Arabia. So what is the libertarian position on this? To sit back and watch the entire Middle East be fall one after another into the hands of ruthless people? I mean, if the, if the United States bolstering the Iraqi government cannot defeat the insurgency, you think they can do it all by themselves? In other words, we are facing a situation where realism forces us to admit that we do have vital interests over there. It is not some woolly-headed pursuit of idealism alone. It is also the pursuit of our own economic welfare and our own basic security. Now, what happens if we do what our opponents want us to do, which is basically to leave? I want to bring us back, in a sense, to 9-11. What was it that made the radical Muslims confident enough to do it? Think about this. The radical Muslims after the Cold War all went back to their own countries. Bin Laden went back to Saudi Arabia. Al-Zawari went back to Egypt. They were fighting to overthrow what they called the near enemy, their own governments. And then they made a very fateful decision to shift strategy and attack the United States. And the interesting question is why? Why did they decide to attack the world's sole superpower? If you can't overthrow Musharraf in Pakistan and Mubarak in Egypt, what makes you think you can attack the United States and get away with it? Bin Laden answers this question very clearly. He says, my intuition was that the United States is basically outwardly tough, but inwardly a bunch of cowards. The United States is all talk and all bluster and can lob a few big bombs, but when the fighting gets tough, the United States will turn tail and run. They did it in Vietnam, they'll do it again. So the radical Muslims have operated under the presupposition that there is a sort of weakness, a decadence, a cowardice at the heart of the United States, and my fear is that, in a sense, if we pull out of Iraq, what are we doing? Consider the situation of an insurgent in Iraq, an insurgent fighting against the U.S. military. There are captured Al-Qaeda documents that have repeatedly shown that the insurgents confess we cannot defeat the U.S. military. We, in other words, we have been reduced, they say, to hit-and-run operations. But why are they hanging in there? Why are they even trying to escalate in Iraq? And the answer is very simple. The Iraqi insurgents and the Islamic radicals have figured out that they don't have to beat us. They don't have to defeat the U.S. military. They don't have to drive us out of the Middle East. They only have to hang in there a little longer for the great impatience and weariness of the American people, stoked by the political left and by some libertarians who basically say, let's pick up the tent, let's go, let's leave. So the dearest objective of the Islamic radicals is being achieved, not by bin Laden making videos persuading us to leave, but by a domestic political force in this country, in a sense pushing to achieve what our enemies want the most. Ultimately, I think if we believe in freedom, we should recognize that we should be prudent in the use of it. We should be careful not to avoid foolishness. We should plan well for the future. But ultimately, freedom, I want to suggest, is a principle that is, in the end, worth fighting for. Thank you. Thank you.